All right, you guys ready to get started? All right. So if you are a person who works with clients and you constantly find yourself putting off your own work to do client work, you're in the right place. Does that sound familiar to anybody? All right. So my name is Nathan Ingram. I am from Birmingham, Alabama. A uh, long way from here. Is it okay if I slip in a y'all every now and then? It's going to be hard for me not to. Uh, I'm the lead organizer for WordCamp Birmingham, which is in a couple of weeks. And we have the best hashtag of all. It's WP Y'all. Isn't that great? Uh, WPYall.com. Uh, I'm the host at iThings Training. So I do two or three live webinars a week. Most of them are free. It's like going to WordCamp all year long. We're at training.ithings.com. I personally have been a web business owner working with clients since 1995. That's when I built and sold my first website. I've been doing this forever. I've worked with all kinds of clients, big and small, great and, you know, not so great. And uh, I'm a business coach for WordPress freelancers as well. That's one of the favorite things that I do for the last four years or so. So I used to start a talk like this with a slide that says, I am not an expert. And then I found a quote by the physicist Dr. Niels Bohr who said, that an expert is a person who has found out by his own experience all the mistakes that one can make in a very narrow field. So by that definition, I am absolutely an expert. Uh, what I can offer you today is all the stupid stuff I've done wrong, and maybe you can avoid some of the mistakes that I've made, especially when it comes to personal productivity. So if you are, uh, how many of these is your first WordCamp? First WordCamp. Awesome. Let's give you guys a hand. Awesome. Don't you guys like to see all these first-time work campers? That's awesome, yes. All right. So the chances, uh, especially if it's your first work camp, of coming into a place like this and wondering, am I the only one that has the problems that I face? Am I the only one who struggles with the issues that I struggle with? Uh, and maybe you have already been in, like, you know, moving around conversations in the uh, breakfast area over here, and people are using acronyms. You may be not quite sure what they mean. And everybody sounds a lot more intelligent than you. If that's been your experience so far, let me encourage you to say that's pretty normal. Uh, we all struggle with different areas, and we all have strengths and weaknesses. We all face common challenges. In four years of coaching conversations, I've found very few unique issues. So let's just do a quick poll. How many of you guys have it all together in your client work? Uh, how many of you never struggle with problem clients? Yeah? Have you, you've totally got the pricing thing figured out. Nobody? Yeah, me either. Uh, how many of you, your site creation process is bulletproof? How many of you have a consistent site creation process? <laughs> Most people don't. You never struggle with isolation or feeling alone. Do, don't we? How many of your income is stable and it doesn't do like this? Okay, see, we are all cut from the same fabric. You are in a community of friends. That is what the, that's one of the great things about WordCamp. So by all means, do not eat lunch alone today. Find some people around you and just simply ask, what do you do with WordPress? And start the conversation. You are in your own tribe here. No matter if you feel alone right now, you can, if you want to, meet some friends and you will have so much in common It'll blow you away. So, here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about one of the common struggles that we all face as freelancers, which is personal productivity. How many of you work from home? Yeah, me too. And my kids are at home because we home educate our children, and yikes, right? So, it's a little challenging. Uh, personal productivity is a common issue that most people struggle with when you're working with clients, especially if you're freelancing. So we're going to spend some time talking about why it's a common struggle. We're going to understand the problem. We're going to develop a strategy to deal with the problem. And I'm going to offer you some suggestions for success. Does that sound okay? And in the middle of that, I'm going to give you a tool that you can use that will hopefully amp up your personal productivity. All right? So that's where we're headed today. And let's start off talking about the common struggle. The common struggle is strategy versus execution. So the first part of this talk today is going to be putting some terminology to a struggle that I believe every freelance web developer faces. Oh, by the way, I'm going to give you a link to all these slides at the end. Okay, so if you are scribbling furiously or typing furiously, it's okay. Just soak it in and I'll give you a link to everything. So we need to put a term to this struggle that we face because I'm of the opinion that if you give a name to your challenge, it's a lot easier to deal with it. 
right? If you can put a label on it and deal with it, it sort of puts it in the box a little better. So we need proficiency because we're in a technical space, right? If you're working with clients, depending on what kind of work you're doing, you need to know the HTML, you need to know the CSS, you need to know some PHP, you need to know some JavaScript or jQuery, depending on what you're doing. I tell people, I know enough PHP for self-defense. I am not a developer, don't want to be a developer. It's that semicolon that always gets me every time. It's always in the wrong place. Maybe you need to know typography, or you need to go know good principles of design, or you need to know great uh, strategy on how to build a website. We all need proficiency on the execution, but we also need proficiency on the strategy side of our business, which means great internal documentation on your processes. And even if you're a one-person shop, you need a list of checklists for everything you do. It's got to get out of your head and on the paper because it's going to make you more efficient, more effective, more profitable. It's also, when you grow, a lot easier to onboard somebody if you already have some checklists. You've got to figure out the strategy on that sort of stuff. The documents, the processes, the marketing, creation of new services, and then personal productivity. We need the execution. There's a lot of great talks this weekend on execution, but we also need the strategy. We need the what we do, but also the why and how we do it. Does that make sense? And those things are at a tension all the time. But both are critical. The problem is, you probably already understand the need for strategy. You're a smart person. You're here at work yet. You're spending the weekend doing geek stuff. I'm going to assume that everybody in here is a pretty smart person. We know we need the need for strategy to become more efficient, more effective, more profitable. But the problem is, the doing of the strategy gets messy. So how does your strategy look right now? If you had to draw a line that would visually represent your strategy. Is it growing, doing better? Or does it look more something like this right here? Yeah, if you're like most of us, you're sort of stuck over there on the right side. You do pretty well sometimes, and then you get kind of hung up in a bend, and then you go backwards a little ways, and forwards, and up and down. And then you have a problem with client, and things go way backwards. And then this is a pretty common struggle. So why is it so hard to keep our strategy in focus? Why is it so difficult to do the strategy piece when we're busy with client work? How many of you have ever read a fantastic blog post and you're like, that's awesome, I need to do that? Maybe it's a technical thing, maybe it's a strategy thing, or maybe you've read a book. I am a wonderful reader of books like the first 25% of them, and then they sit on my shelf. Anybody else do that? Like you start a book, you're like, yeah, and I've got this whole shelf of books I'm supposed to read. Um, or you find this amazing thing at WordCamp. Like you're going to leave probably this weekend with a notebook full of ideas. How many of you here were, last, were, were here last year? You left with like a major list of stuff to do. And how much of it did you actually get accomplished? Nah, right? Yeah. So why is it that that happens? You've got this great list of stuff that you know you need to do, but that list only seems to get longer. It never seems to get shorter. Things are added, but very few things ever get marked off. So what are you going to do with all the great ideas that you leave WordCamp with this weekend? Great ideas that are never implemented. And it's not that you want to have great intentions about it. It's that life gets in the way, right? You get home and you've taken how many days off to be here? For me, it's some travel involved. I'll be gone a few days. And during that time, some customer demands came up. Or some family issues got in the way. And all of a sudden, it's three months later and you've done nothing. Does that sound familiar? I know this because I live this. Right? We are all cut from the same fabric. So I want to put a word to this whole idea that's going to help us to start working towards a solution and that word is whirlwind. Whirlwind. Whirlwind is a great word because that looks like life in business, doesn't it? You've got a million emails and a million demands and a million things to do and things you ought to do and things you suppose have done already. And they're all swirling around you all at the same time. And sometimes it's hard to make heads or tails out of things. Right? So let's spend a little bit of time understanding this whirlwind. The whirlwind 
is the energy and attention that's needed to run your business. The whirlwind is the urgent. The whirlwind are the 15 emails from clients that are waiting on you in the morning, all with demands of things that have to be done by noon. The whirlwind is that customer call that happens right as you are just about to work on your own website for a change. The whirlwind is that one hour meeting with a client that stretches into three. Does all this sound familiar? So you come to your desk with the best of intentions. It's going to finally be a day where I work on my stuff for a change, and it lasts about 10 minutes because you opened your email and the whirlwind was waiting on you. So I've spent hours and hours in seminars and webinars and reading books all full of excellent information that could really help my business, and I never implemented any of it at all. It was great stuff, but it ended up making no practical impact on my world. And it wasn't the author of the book's fault. It wasn't the presenter's fault. It's because when I got back to my desk, there were all those emails and all those phone calls and a hundred other things I had to do in that day. Or... <laughs> Or maybe I got fascinated by a new shiny piece of technology and I spent half a day working on something that really didn't move the large sticks in my business. I'm sure none of you would do that, that's only me. Okay. Yeah. So here's the problem with the whirlwind. We know that goals and strategy are important, but the whirlwind is the urgent. Franklin Covey Franklin Company, Company has this great statement. When urgency and importance clash, urgency wins every time, doesn't it? Strategy is important. Those customer demands are urgent, and urgency wins every time. So what do we do? We say, oh, I'll get to it later, tomorrow, next week. Now here's the problem. Delaying strategy doesn't work because the whirlwind never goes away. What we never seem to realize is that I'll say, I'll work on it tomorrow. I'll get to that next week. I'll do it next month when I finish this project. And what we don't realize is that tomorrow, next week, next month, the whirlwind is still going to be waiting on us. The whirlwind never goes away. Now, before you get a bad taste in your mouth about this whole concept of the whirlwind, let me just remind you, the whirlwind is not bad. It just is what it is. The whirlwind is actually pretty good. It's your business. It's your work that you have to do. I mean, if it weren't for the whirlwind, you couldn't pay your bills, most likely. I mean, you can sort of tame the whirlwind down a little bit and make more sense out of it, but the whirlwind is the stuff that makes us money, generally speaking. It isn't bad, it just is what it is. It's a fact of life if you're running a business, if you're working with clients. So we have to accept the whirlwind and consider it as we figure out how to move our businesses forward in the middle of the whirlwind. Okay. So now we get into how to do with that. A strategy to deal with the whirlwind. We need a plan. We need a plan to accomplish our goals while the whirlwind is swirling around us. So if you're a freelancer, if you're a web business owner, you're a smart person, you have some level of discipline, otherwise you wouldn't be working for yourself, your challenge is not accomplishing your goals. Your challenge is accomplishing your goals in the middle of this whirlwind that you're in. Now here's a foundational principle. Without a plan, the whirlwind always wins. It always wins. Urgency and importance, right? I've got to have a plan or the whirlwind is going to win. And you've seen this happen, right? You've seen it happen. You have great intentions, but you get sidetracked. So we've got to have some sort of a plan. So I'm going to uh, suggest to you a very simple plan that I think can actually help you get some traction in this issue. It's going to start with a, it's basically three phases. There's an initial planning, there's a weekly planning, and a weekly execution. Now, this is doable, I promise. I've been doing this for years, and this approach has transformed my personal productivity. Transformed. 
I tell people when they're first starting a freelance business, there are three important things you need to pay attention to. Number one, you want to systematize everything you do, get it as down to as much of a process as you possibly can. Number two, you want to build recurring revenue as quickly as possible. Number three, you've got to get a handle on personal productivity. Because there are only a few things about your business and working with clients that you can control, and how you spend your time is one of them. We need a plan. So when you start off with some initial planning, then there's a weekly planning and a weekly execution. Let's talk about first, uh, the first step here, which is this first planning meeting. And I'm going to give you a tool to make that a little bit easier. The initial planning meeting is a meeting that you have with yourself where you stop everything, you unplug, yes, that is possible, and you go somewhere that you enjoy. Coffee shop, your back deck, your you know, favorite cafe down the street. Some stimulating environment, whether it's quiet or noisy, whatever works for you, turn off all screens. Because what happens when you open a screen? Ding, ding, email, text message, client, whirlwind, whirlwind, right? This is what happens. The screens are the key to the whirlwind mostly. So we turn all that stuff off. I'm going to schedule this as a priority. I'm going to suggest something very radical in a conference like this, and that is get a piece of paper and a pen. <laughs> because analog works for this sort of thing. I'm going to give you a tool in just a minute you can download that you can print out and take a pen or a pencil. Pen is for those of you who are very self-confident. The pencil is like, I'm going to erase stuff, so I need a pencil. <laughs> Whatever works for you, and unplug and focus on this stuff. This needs to be on your calendar with a couple of reminders so you remember to do it. Because urgency and importance, urgency wins every time. So you have to schedule this and make it as urgent as any other bit of client work that you're doing. Because you are your most important client. True? You are the most important client. And if you're worried about, well, I can't serve my clients well if I take this time off to work on my business, that's a fallacy that so many folks have. If you're not around in a year because you didn't do the strategy part of your business well, who's going to take care of your clients then? Taking care of your business is one of the most important things you can do to serve your clients well. So it's got to be on the calendar with a reminder, two hours unplugged as a priority. Now in those two hours, you're going to do two tasks. Two hours, two tasks. Identify the issues that you need to change in your business and plan some action items. Can you do that? Two hours, two tasks. What are the main things I need to do to grow my business? And then plan some action items to actually accomplish those. Identifying the issues. What are the changes that I need to make and which are going to bring the most immediate results? Remember, I'm going to give you all these slides, so don't worry about scribbling things down. Two hours, two tasks. Identify the issues. What do I need to change? And what are going to bring the most immediate results and pick the top three? Why the top three? Because you need to figure out the three most important things that are going to make immediate impact in your business. Because when you're trying to establish a habit, momentum is everything. So you want small wins. Things you can do quickly that will radically make a difference in your business. Does that make sense? Identify your top three. Immediate impact builds momentum, and you're going to need that kind of momentum because you are fighting an uphill battle. You are swimming upstream. You ever see those videos of the crazy reporters standing out in the hurricanes? What are those people thinking? And they're standing there being, this is you in the whirlwind. And you've got to think, I'm going to be walking directly into that wind, so I need some momentum. I need some wins at the very beginning to get this thing started. Now, by the way, the three things that you pick out right here are probably not going to be things that you enjoy doing. Because you would have done them already. Right? So just keep that in mind. These are probably not going to be fun things, but they'll be big things that bring immediate impact. Now the second thing you're going to do in that two-hour planning session is plan some action items. You're going to break those goals into th uh, three goals into action items. They're going to take you about two to four hours to complete. So when you figure out this is a thing I need to do, I need to have, for example, a contract in my business. How many of you have great contracts? How many of you have, yeah, yeah, it's got kind of an issue, yeah, right. 
Okay, so I need to improve my internal documentation. I need a better proposal template. I need whatever it is. I need to learn what in the world Gutenberg is. And I'm going to break those things into two to four hour action items. And there's a reason for that that I'll get to in a minute. Now, unless this starts to dissolve into lots of details, let me give you a tool. You can go to nathanigram.com slash WCBOS. That's the hashtag for today. That's also the link on my website where you can download my advanced goal worksheets. Advance is my coaching service for freelancers, and this is a tool that we use. Uh, nathanigram.com slash WCBOS. And let me pull those up on the screen because I want to show you what that looks like. Okay. Now this is the part where I get to try to control that screen while standing over here with a teeny tiny mouse, and I'm not sure how this is going to work. Okay, so how many of you have heard before the term SMART goals? Okay, SMART goals, I think it's the best way to goal plan, uh, to, to, to set your goals. Now, I do it a little different because I take the SMART goal and I turn it into a declaration. I'll tell you why in just a minute. So SMART is an acronym. It stands for Specific Measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. Those are five characteristics that make up a good goal. A good goal, for example, isn't I need to make more money in my business next year. A good goal is I need to raise my first quarter earnings by 10%. That's a smart goal. There's a big difference there. So uh, this is a tool that you're going to use when you identify the three top issues. You're going to put them into a, a, this smart goal template. If you do this, I promise the goal will be much easier to execute. So the S in SMART goal stands for specific, and you're going to ask yourself, what do I really want to accomplish? These are questions that answer the who, what, when, where, and how. I'm going to give you an example of this in just a second. Measurable means how do I know I'm making progress? Add in some things about how much and how many. Attainable. Is this a goal I can actually achieve? What are the obstacles? Am I, am I going to overcome those? And what are my next steps? Attainable. The R stands for relevant. And this is maybe the most important one. This is where a lot of goal setting falls off. And it's why is this goal important? Why am I doing this to begin with? The R in SMART goals, the relevancy piece, is whirlwind repellent. Because this is going to help you remember, this is why I'm going through the hassle of doing this to begin with. The T is time bound. When is it going to be accomplished? Okay, here's an example. I need to create a social media service to create and manage social properties and content for my clients. That's pretty specific, right? Who, what, where, when, how? Yeah. Okay, so in this example, our goal is I need to build a social media service. Because I need to do more than just build websites. I need to do some other stuff to get some recurring revenue coming into my business. Does that make sense? Pretty good goal. If you can do that, if that's your thing, awesome. So that's specific. The, R, the A, uh, the M, sorry, measurable. Well, how do I know I'm making progress? I'm going to start with Facebook. I'm going to then move to in, uh, Instagram and Pinterest. The attainable. Yes, the attainable. I need to understand Facebook better, develop a template for social marketing, determine the best platform for management. It's attainable, and I can do these things. There's a few first actions listed. Relevant. Why am I doing this to begin with? Because I need to offer more than just web creation services. And adding a social media management service is the key to building recurring revenue. By the way, all this is in the download. Time bound. I'll have this service ready to vote by April 30th. Now, here's the, the thing about this particular worksheet. It is the declaration. What you're going to do is take the elements of the SMART goal and turn it into a statement that you're going to put on your computer, on your whiteboard, so it's staring at you all the time. And it's pretty easy to do. I will, and you combine the specific and measurable elements by this time, because or so that the relevancy. Here's how it would look. I will create a social media management service for my clients using Facebook by April the 30th because it's a key to building recurring revenue in my business. You put that in front of you, so it's staring at you, nagging at you, mocking you every day. And when the whirlwind comes up, you look at that thing and you remember, no, I've got to spend the two hours working on this that I've scheduled because I've got to build my recurring revenue. Does that make sense? You put the so that right in front of you, and that helps to put the whirlwind in perspective. 
Now, I've given you another worksheet. We're not going to spend time on this really because of time here. There's also a goal manager. And it's in this one that you actually start to flesh the goal out. It's in that two-hour planning meeting that you're going to be doing these worksheets for each of the goals if you want to follow this method. So you pull your goal in. This is the declaration from the previous worksheet. And you start jotting down some things. What are some of the stuff I need to do? I need to understand Facebook conversion, all the stuff that I need to do. These are the resources and information I need to actually accomplish this goal. Start making some notes. Hey, here's a competitor that offers it for this much and this certain setup fee. And then you start listing some action items. Two to four hour action items in a list. And you're, the secret here is you're going to do it one of these every week. One to two of these every week. Right, so you mark off some next actions. Does that make sense? I, I get, this is normally a 45-minute talk, but I have to do it in 30, so I'm going to blow past this. If you want to talk, I'll be outside after. Okay, so that's the tool. And you can download that at NathanIngram.com, WCBOS. Okay. So that's your initial planning. Two hours, two tasks. Two hours, two tasks. I've got my goals laid out. I've got some action items laid out. Now, we're going to do a weekly planning session. This is where most people fall off the wagon. They get excited. They do the initial thing. they got all this stuff to do. But they don't take time each week to plan the time to execute. They just think they can go straight to executing. It's a mistake. Don't avoid this. Take a half hour before the week starts and plan your week. Yes, it is possible to plan your week, even if you're a freelance web developer who is constantly barraged by client requests. It is possible to plan your week. So before the week starts, for me, it's always Friday afternoon. Friday afternoons are CEO time for me. That's when I spend the time working on my business and I'm planning the next week. Uh, if I can't get the planning piece done, I do it Sunday night. When everything's quiet in the house, kids are going to bed, I do the planning of the week then. Or some people I'm coaching do it early Monday morning. But the point is, before you hit the chair Monday morning in your office, you got the week planned. Because without the plan, the whirlwind is always going to win. It's always going to win. I promise you. You're going to try to do this without the plan, and the whirlwind is going to win. And you remember, that guy in Boston said, the whirlwind's going to win if I don't have a plan. Because it does. It just, it just does. So take that 30 minutes plan time to execute at least one action and then pull everything together to make it so that when you sit down to accomplish that, you've got everything you need to do it. Okay? Here's how my weekly planning typically looks. I divide each day into three blocks. My family usually gets one of those. Family's a big priority for me. My family usually gets one of these. So there's morning, afternoon, and evening. And the thing about us freelancers, we're pretty flexible, right? We can kind of do stuff as we want to do it. And so weekly planning looks something like this. Yes, I plan time for the whirlwind. Mondays are all about the whirlwind. Because for whatever reason, the winds blow stronger during the weekends, right? And you come in, there's like 87 emails in your inbox on Monday morning. So Monday is all about the whirlwind, the evening, you know, this is just a for example. And that, and this week, my family gets the most nights, generally. Tuesday, I'm going to spend some time in the afternoon working on a project that I don't need to get finished. So that's project time. During project time, I don't look at email. I don't answer my phone. I am turned off. So whirlwind in the morning, project in the afternoon, family gets the evening. Same thing for Wednesday. Oh, Thursday morning, my kid's got some stuff that maybe I'll, she wants me to be part of. I'm going to go to whatever this trip is that her class is doing on Thursday morning. Well, that means I'm going to be working that night, probably. My family always gets one of the blocks. Now, sometimes if I'm on a big project, I'm working morning, afternoon, and evening for a few days in a row to knock it out. You know how that goes, right? This approach lets you say, wait a minute, I owe my family three blocks. So I'm going to pay that back. Either by taking a couple afternoons off or a whole day, another after, whatever it is. It's sort of, my wife is really good about reminding me how much debt I have in the blocks here, right? Uh, and so Friday, afternoon is strategy time, whirlwind in the morning, family in the evening. Make sense? I mean, this is dirt simple. It's not simple, it's not going to work for personal productivity. It's got to be simple. The whirlwind can be contained by good productivity habits and being deliberate about your time, scheduling calls and emails. Don't ever be, well, that's an absolute statement. 
I would encourage you to rarely be available on demand by either email or phone. Because your clients will start to monopolize your time. Schedule those calls. Don't respond to emails right away. I mean, unless the site is down, which is very rare. So during that, uh, the, the weekly execution, that's what you saw on Friday, the red block, the strategy block, two to four hours, I'm going to schedule that time, and I'm going to execute one or two of those two to four hour action items that we talked about. I got four hours on Friday afternoon, I'm going to do either two two hour things or one four hour thing that afternoon. And I don't want anything interrupted. I don't schedule client meetings on, two, on Friday afternoons. I don't let it happen. That's my time. It's my CEO time. It's strategy time for my business. How many times have you ever put off your own work because the client had an immediate demand? We do it, right? But you are your most important client, so don't overschedule that time. Whatever time of the week that you block off as your strategy time, that's yours, and don't violate it. Again, if the server's down, okay, right, but that's rare, right? Usually it's because, I mean, am I, am I right here? It's a lot easier to do work for a client than it is to do our own strategy work, right? So having it on the calendar schedule helps you do that. Now, one more thing, what do you do when you run out of action items? You do another immediate, uh, another um, initial planning phase. So after you've picked and accomplished those top three goals, that's probably going to take you about 12 weeks to do. For the next quarter, you come back in and do it again. You pick three more. You plan it out. So you get in this cycle. There's a great book called The 12 Week Year. If you've actually finished that one, if, you, if you've never read it, I would encourage you to get it. It's, it's all about planning your, your year in quarterly chunks. It's wonderful. Now, we're almost out of time here. I've got two final suggestions to leave you with. You will always, always, always have more goals than you have time, so prioritize well. Like I said earlier, focus on immediate impact to build momentum. There's a psychology to this. Small wins keep you going. And moving forward in the world when it takes a lot of small wins and momentum at the beginning. So immediate impact. There's a great study that Franklin Covey did uh, under this whole concept of the law of diminishing returns. How many of you have heard that phrase before? Law of the Returns. Here's what they found in a corporate environment. If a team had two to three clearly defined goals, they would accomplish two to three goals with excellence. If a team had four to ten, they would accomplish one to two. If they had 11 to 20 goals, they'd accomplish zero. Think about it. Looks like you're eating a pizza. If you're trying to eat two to three pizzas, you might be able to do that in a, you know, your family in a day. If you got more pizzas, you're going to eat less and less. There's only so many bites a day you can take, right? It's the same sort of a thing. So most of us go into this thing with gangbusters, saying, I'm going to do it, I'm going to get productive, it's all going to work. Uh, and we have so many goals, and then all of a sudden, we get nothing done. One or two, three goals at the most at a time, and you'll accomplish that many. That means that sometimes good ideas, I might even say great ideas, have to be put on a shelf because they do not bring the most immediate impact. And that's okay. We'll get to them later this year. The second pro tip I would give you is taming the whirlwind takes time. you got to give yourself a break. There's a great quote that is attributed to G.K. Chesterton. I'm not sure if it's true or if he actually said it. He's one of those people that people attribute every quote to. Uh, I don't know, but... Anything worth doing is worth doing badly at first, and I love that. You're going to mess up on this, and it's okay. The whirlwind is a strong and powerful force that you've been contending with the wrong way for a long time, and it's going to take you some time to develop some new habits. That's okay. It's worth doing, so it's worth doing badly at first. Make sense? So just stick with it, because the whirlwind never, ever, ever goes away. When urgency and importance clash, urgency wins every time, so you've got to keep and execute that strategy to accomplish your goals in the middle of the world. Right now, wrapping up, in six months from now, if you did this, and you went through two quarterly cycles, if you did this for six months, how much would your business change? How much would it change? Really, think about it. What could you get done? How much would you grow? How many problems would you have solved? How much better would your business systems be? And then as a result of that, how much better would your life be? If you have less stress because your business was going better, your income was stabilizing, you started keeping problem clients in check, how much better would your life be? Probably better. 
My name is Nathan Ingram. You can find me at training.items.com, and there is the link for today. We have five minutes for questions. Any questions? Right there. I think there's a very scary microphone that they want you to stand on. I can on. talk pretty loud. The, the thing about the projects, the number of projects, is reminding me of this analogy I use, which is moving footballs down a field. And if you're trying to move one football down a field, you get one down the field. If you're trying to manage ten footballs, you don't get anything down the field. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they, they want the mics for the uh, recording, sorry. How many hours do you plan to work in a week? The question for the recording is how many hours do I usually work in a week? It depends on the week, honestly. Um, I typically work 40 to 50 hours a week. That's pretty normal. Yes. What would you suggest for people that are working full-time jobs and also trying to do freelance work, press work on the side? Because I find that to be my biggest obstacle. And at what point should I consider transitioning from my full-time job that's not work press related to being a full-time freelancer? Oh, it's such a great question. How many other people struggle with that same issue right now? Look around the room, look around. This is a common question, it's a common struggle. So look at who was, if you guys need to have lunch together. Seriously. Okay, so the question is, how do you balance a full-time job and freelancing? It's tough, man. You have a very understanding family. If you have a family, uh, you know, a very understanding family that's on board with that mission of transition. Um, how do you do it? Build recurring revenue as quickly as possible. That's a broken record for me. Because what will happen, the more recurring revenue you have, that revenue comes in every month no matter what. WordPress maintenance contracts are the best, fastest way to do that. Every single project you want, you want to have website management attached to that. That's 50, 75, 100, 150, whatever you can charge a month, that's what it ought to be. And what will start to happen is you'll be able to start replacing a portion of your paycheck with that recurring revenue. For a few years now, I've paid myself exclusively by the recurring revenue. Everything else is great. So, you know, that, that's the goal. Build recurring revenue as quickly as possible. Build a good, strong client base with lots of um, referrals coming in. That's what your the emphasis needs to be. That's a very short answer to a very complicated question that I'll be happy to talk more about after. Yes? Hey there, I'm Laura Bell, a musician in Nashville and also a speaker for tomorrow. I just wanted to take a second and do a shameless plug for my talk tomorrow because we're going to go over exactly a lot of that and also some of the checklists and processes you talked about. I'm going to share exact processes and things to stay really efficient with the client work. So some of these questions we're getting into, we're going to talk about there as well tomorrow. Awesome. What time is that tomorrow? I'm not sure what time it is, but it's uh, how, uh, how running a WordPress design agency allowed me to follow my dreams of becoming a musician, 210. 210 tomorrow, definitely, so you guys check that one out. Other questions? I think we have a minute or two left. One minute, exactly. Okay, we're done. Thank you guys. I'll be outside the room if you have more